And uh, I would like to talk about uh, this work that I um, did in, in collaboration with Marco Monacini from Trento and Elisa Davoli from Vienna. And this is very much in the spirit from, of a, uh, providing an analytical validation of a model that was proposed for a study in this uh, Lambuie and Roger uh, transfer, which is a process for constructing, making actually team films. Um, so the, this process is, 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 is very used in, in the applications and it, um, I think it's almost 100 years old or something like that. It was proposed initially uh, by, by Catherine Blodgett and then uh, perfected in her collaboration with Irving Lemuir, uh, a picture of whom was actually present in, in uh, uh, the slides of uh, TEFIC today. Um, and it's a way to uh, deposing, for, for, for deposing a thin film made of amphiphilic molecule, molecules on a solid substrate. substrate. So amphiphilic molecules are polar molecules. They are, uh, divided, can be divided into two parts. So there's a head which is um, hydrophilic, so it likes to be with water. And there's a tail which is hydrophobic, so it likes to, go, to stay away from water. And it's, uh, they are basically the main components of, of cell membranes in our body. Um, the, the reason why these thin films are so popular is because the, the manufacturing process can um, um, make it, makes it possible to obtain them with, with, a, with a very high level of precision. So this picture here is a one monolayer. So there's one layer of, of these thin films made of these um, amphiphilic molecules, and also they can exhibit interesting uh, geometrical striping and patterning. So according to uh, some parameters that one can tune, and this is also part of the interest of this of these theme films. Uh, um, Non-trivial structures can be obtained. So the color coding here is for the uh, for the um, liquid expanded uh, phase or the liquid condensed phase, meaning that uh, the disorder state or or order state. And uh, the the way these are made is by extraction. So you should imagine to have a trough, which is a container with liquid, maybe water. Uh, I think water is fine for, for the applications. And then you have a substrate in the middle that you want to pull up at a certain velocity v, uh, which we actually call beta in the paper. So the velocity of extraction is going to be called beta. And uh, you, you have some moving barriers that push the, the, the free amphiphilic molecules uh, towards the substrate in a way that the concentration at the separation point here um, is roughly constant. And uh, this is a little bit exploded in a way that you can show, it can show that there can be a meniscus effect, so it's not a completely a sharp transition between being flat and then the substrate coming up. But there's also some, some of these curvature effects here. And uh, one can assume that in the uh, free surface, they're floating free in the disordered phase. Uh, I like to say that this is like a Mikado, Shanghai, in, in Italian, like the game with the sticks. And then when, when you pull the substrate up, you can obtain different, different effects. So in this case, for instance, you see the mole aligned, so this would be an ordered phase, whereas uh, numerical computations show that uh, varying the, uh, the extraction velocity v, or beta as I will call it later, you can obtain different effects. So you start uh, at the, on one edge of your specimen here with minus one, that would be the concentration of, of, of so the value of the order parameter, that means that they are disordered. And then if the velocity is slow, then quite immediately you have an ordered phase going up in, the, um, in your sample. And also if you uh, raise the velocity a little bit, but then if you, for, for higher values of the velocity, you observe the, tr the patterning. So this going up and down is, is disordered phase, ordered phase, disordered phase, ordered phase. And then you obtain something which is almost disordered if you pull out, if you pull out too, too fast, meaning that maybe the, the, the molecules do not have enough time to stick together and organize, and, organize, and they still stay in the disordered phase. Um, so the title carried Canilliard in, in it, so this is a one slide crash course of what the Canilliard equation is and how we are going to um, fix the ideas. Uh, the Canilliard equation was, was proposed to, to study, uh, to study the, 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 the the coexistence of, of liquids at two different phases, or, or, or two different liquids that are immiscible, or for instance, also one, one liquid or one, one substance in, in, in different, um, in different uh, states of the order parameter. And it is subject to a double well potential, this W of S, which prefers pure phases or order and disordered phases uh, at its wells. And then the equation is this one. So you want to 
evolve with time, the concentration, and, and this obeys this law. And it's interesting to notice that this law, this PDE, comes out as the H minus one gradient flow of an energy, which is this one. So basically kinetic energy, UX is the derivative, and then the potential energy here, okay? Um, the perturbation of this model that was proposed in, uh, in the paper that from which the simulations were taken uh, carried out uh, some adjustments. So for instance, they considered the constant concentration of the amphiphiles at the liquid surface. As I said, this is the effect of pushing the barriers to have a constant concentration. And then the double well potential is slightly tilted in a way that the wells are at C0. Um, one of the wells is at C0. And then this zeta of x uh, is what uh, keeps track of the meniscus effect, okay? Uh, and then beta positive is, is our transfer velocity, which goes uh, from bottom to top. And then this equation here, so that's the one where you take derivative of this double well potential, and you add the term that comes from the drift coming up from the extraction velocity, was proposed in this paper by Wilczek and Gurevich for um, explaining the phenomenon of, the, of the, the position of the films that I showed you before in the cartoon. So the idea was, was very much in the spirit of what uh, Irene said in the first day of, as, as an introduction to this workshop, that can we validate analytically this model? So they used this to, to run simulations and they um, complemented the equation with uh, suitable boundary conditions. Um, so can, our aim was to try and see if this was, was actually um, good for, for, from the analytical point of view. So what we did was to make suitable assumptions on, the, on our double well potential, and we take uh, such, such a double well potential, we require it to be of class C3 with some uh, boundedness from below, and also this boundedness in of, of, the spatial, of, of the S derivative, so S here would be replaced by the function described in the other parameter, and for some positive constants K0 and, K0 and K1, and then we, we fix an initial condition which is zero at zero, for convenience, and also in such a way that the functions live in a function space, which is, uh, which is a fine. And then this equation is exactly the same that, that we had in the previous slide, and the boundary conditions are inherited from what they, uh, they looked for uh, for the simulation. So um, u at, at space zero, that would be at the bottom of our specimen, is equal to zero, which is why we require this, and we made the translation by the C0. Um, the effect of asking the first derivative to vanish at L, which is the end of the specimen, um, embodies the fact that we, we can observe the specimen as being very, very large. So we see what happens in the far field and this stabilizes, which, is, um, which can be seen as an average effect if we have patterning, but just in, in far away. And then these other ones um, come from, from considerations that are similar to these. And then we fix an initial datum, which is a given u0, a given function u0 that depends, that depends on, on x. So our model is one-dimensional, I should say, and uh, in the paper <coughs> from which the physics was taken, they also prove, uh, they also consider the two-dimensional case where the patterning can occur into two different dimensions that would give us checkerboards. Uh, we're not there yet, so I'm just restricting our analysis to, to 1D, but still we find interesting results. And uh, in particular, we provide a suitable functional setting to, to pose this problem. We give a uh, notion of solution, in particular of weak solution, which is uh, good for proving an existence and uniqueness theorem together with some dependence on the, initial condition, uh, on the initial conditions. And also we discuss the case beta small, because in the case beta small, it's like there is no drift. And so what we, what we expect to happen is that the solutions in a way converge to the solution of the no unperturbed can Hilliard. Okay, so what is interesting for us is actually that also for the case beta small, we prove the existence of a semi-group property uh, for the solutions as well, as I'll show you in, in the final slides. And the functional setting now is, is the following one. So we fix a function space, fix a function space which is H1, and we impose a boundary condition at the, at the left end of our specimen, and in this one we define a scalar product, and also we consider the dual. The idea is to use uh, a Hilbert triple where we embed our solutions um, for, uh, for the analysis. And uh, you should keep in mind that every now and then there will appear a Z, Z, Psi. So this is the representation, the, the, the function that comes out as, as from the um, Ries representation theorem uh, for dual Sovirber spaces. Um, and now we're ready to give the, 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 the notion of weak solution. So let's, let us fix an initial datum 
a weak solution that corresponds to this initial datum on a fixed time interval zero t is a function that assumes, attains the initial datum at time equals zero, <coughs> and then enjoys these four properties. So we have a regularity statement. The function needs to be in this function space. So H1 with values in V prime and L2 uh, with values in H3. So there is some regularity of our solution in both time and space. Uh, the chemical potential mu, which is defined in the usual way, is of class L2. And also the equation is satisfied in the suitable weak sense, which is testing in V and V prime as, as here. And uh, the, these boundary conditions are attained uh, uh, by the solutions. So the, the existing theorem is, as it contains uh, three statements. Uh, one is that given a initial, an initial datum, then for any given time there exists a, uh, there exists a unique weak solution in the, uh, no, in, in the sense that I just told you before that corresponds to this datum x uh, u naught. Then uh, um, if we construct this energy, that's again uh, the time derivative, so the kinetic energy plus the potential energy, this uh, enjoys an energy equality, in, which is written down here. And then uh, there's a statement about the continuous dependence on the initial data, which uh, reads this way. So we fix a positive m, and then there exists a constant in such a way that if any two initial data are contained in the ball of radius m, then the corresponding weak solutions uh, satisfy this, uh, this estimate here the stability estimate, estimate in, in terms of the function of the constant CM and the distance of the initial solutions at the beginning. And the strategy of the proof uh, is essentially divided into two parts. So since we have this drift element, uh, the, the, the minus beta ux, this, the, 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 the PDE doesn't enjoy a variational structure. So we thought about uh, fixing the, the, that term for the moment, the one that, say, uh, makes the solution, the, the, the equation non-variational. So we fix a Q prime in, in uh, so the derivative of Q for any Q fixed, and then we construct a solution to this, uh, say, Canillard equation with a forcing term. And then uh, this can be done by using minimizing movement schemes. So this is a technique which is uh, fairly uh, known and, and, and yields the results that we, that we needed. And then um, we also prove the uniqueness of, of the solution of the minimizing movement scheme. And then we set up a fixed point argument to show that indeed, to show that indeed that the solution, that this Q prime, um, so the equation holds with Q prime equals to UQ. Okay? So for the minimizing movement scheme, we have. Um, we need to define this auxiliary energy, and then uh, we have this, um, uh, this functional here, which is the usual one that you want to minimize. So you take your energy, which is the psi q given up here, you take a penalization in the larger space v prime, um, and then you want to see um, at every next step if you fix, so you want to minimize this, uh, this energy here. Okay, so you, you're given u at step k minus one, and then you minimize the energy big phi k, uh, and so is, is, is a discretization of, of times. And then um, we need to infer, actually, uh, we prove that this uh, arc mean is non-empty, so there's, there exists a solution that belongs to the space V. And then for every K, we can prove that the solutions are of class uh, H4, and they, enjoy the, they satisfy the equation written in these terms, uh, together with the suitable boundary conditions that we require. So now we can construct the interpolants that are uh, piecewise affine, and then show that there exists a function u infinity enjoying that, that regularity up there, such that as the um, time step discretization parameter goes to zero, then uh, this one um, converges um, as you expect from, from setting up a minimizing movement scheme. So this converge, the convergences are, are a little bit technical, and it's also very technical to prove them. Um, what we have is that uh, the final, the, the, the limit u infinity um, enjoys the equation that we need to enjoy. Okay, so this solves for almost every uh, point in space-time this, this equation here, together with the boundary conditions that we were requiring in the definition of solution. And uh, now to prove that uh, we, can, we can plug here the u dot infinity itself, um, we set up a minima uh, the, the, this fixed point argument, and uh, so now this u infinity 
is the UQ, which is the solution associated by fixing this particular Q. And uh, we proved that this map S is continuous and compact, and the technique to get to there uh, is to use uh, the, some estimates that we obtained from the minimizing movement scheme and then the obelion simons theorem. And then we consider this set lambda, which is the set where uh, the map is a contraction, and we show that this is bounded in L2 of 0 T with values in V. So by a standard application of Schaeffer's fixed point theorem, we obtain that the fixed point uh, indeed exists. So we're done with, uh, with proving that Q is equal to UQ. And now by construction, um, the UQ enjoys uh, some regularity properties, and these uh, also can pass to, 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 to this point here. So this is the equation that we, that we want to be satisfied. And the, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the, these uh, conditions here are, are attained as well. So the boundary conditions at zero and about the derivative in L, and also the initial condition is attained. And then we, we computed what the, um, what the chemical potential is, and indeed it belongs to L2. So this, is, uh, this was the second point of the definition of weak solution. And then UQ is indeed a weak solution to the problem that I wrote at the beginning um, that corresponds to the initial datum U0. Uh, so as far as the energy equality, as far as the energy equality is concerned, uh, we, I recall you that, that it was written in this, in this fashion. So this is obtained by testing the weak formulation with the chemical potential. And then you can play around with integration by parts uh, and uh, some technical, some technicalities, and you obtain this formula here, which is the energy equality up to showing that this uh, duality product is indeed the time, uh, the rate of change in time of the of the energy along a solution, and this can be can be proved. So we recover the energy equality, and this also yields a uniform estimate, uh, which is independent, which is independent of time. So this also allows us to prove uniqueness of, of the solution. And uh, yeah, so, and, and so the proof of the theorem is, is, completely, is completely over. So as far as the case beta small is concerned, let me recap what we did so far, because this will be useful for, the, for the treating the case beta small. So given an initial datum, you not, we proved the existence and uniqueness of a solution in our sense of, of, of weak solutions, okay? that is associated with this, with the U0 that we fixed. So the time t didn't really play a role in there, so t was arbitrary. So this means that uh, we actually get existence and uniqueness in zero plus infinity, okay? The initial datum is attained and these regularity properties are attained. So about the solution, about the chemical potential, and uh, we have the weak formulation here where I'm putting in evidence now the dependence on beta. Because what we, you would like to have is that when beta vanishes, also this contribution vanishes, and, and you recover the um, unperturbed Canilliard. So now, to do this, we, we went through a construction of a semigroup, which is this G beta here, which contains uh, the maps little gt, um, where the map G at time t of u0 is the value ut of the solution attained at time t. So it's the evolution at time t of the solution, which starts from the initial u0. And this one is, uh, is a continuous semigroup. So there's a theory of, of semigroups for these equations that can be backtracked to John Ball. And uh, um, we need to prove that the semigroup has a global attractor. In this way, um, so that we have a, a condition about on, on beta, which is that beta needs to be smaller than a certain quantity, which is L, that's the length of, the, of, our, of our domain, to the minus three, so ideally, this is a small parameter, and then in this condition, the semigroup has a global, has a global attractor. So to obtain this, we prove that uh, G beta is bounded at point dissipative, um, and that it is compact. So these are notions that come from the theory of semigroups, and uh, they uh, involve uh, what happens when, um, so you study the basin of attractions of, 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 of limit points, and, and see that, um, that this basing of attraction is, is large enough, basically. So uh, from any point in space where you can start, you collapse uh, into, into the attractor. And uh, this yields, uh, as, as a final estimate, this, this one here. So if you call u bar the, this, the, the, the solution of the unperturbed Canilliard 
equation, then we can estimate the distance in the, sp the difference in the space v by c beta. So this is what we actually wanted to recover, that when beta goes to zero, this distance vanishes, meaning that our model with the perturbation uh, goes back to, converges to the, um, to the um, Canilliard um, without, without the perturbation. And what was interesting for us, for us was to prove that not only in the case where the Canilliard functional, the Canilliard equation is unperturbed, but also in our case with a small perturbation, then there is a, um, a semi-group structure that can be that can be extrapolated from, from our equation. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you for the last talk. Are there questions or comments? Any comment? Yes, thank you. Maybe if there are no other comments, I will just uh, dare to comment that uh, maybe calling this uh, kinetic energy is probably misleading because kinetic energy means uh, time derivative and not, not space derivative. And uh, that perturbation is also maybe uh, just some, uh, it smears out uh, the, the viewpoint that it's in fact a standard Carnelliard, but only with convective derivative. Excuse convective me. time derivative. Yeah? It's in, in some moving environment with velocity beta. And um, it's just convective derivative, nothing more. Okay, so the... the it's just the, comment, yeah. So, no, thank you, thank you for the observation. So the first thing about the time derivative, um, where when we take the energy um, here, th the prime is indeed a time derivative, and then it's integrated in space. So this looks like very much kinetic term because we take time derivatives and well the, 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 this one will give will give the evolution of the uh, this is related to the, the to our u dot here uh, no 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 okay no 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 you're right I, I'm sorry I'm sorry yeah th this is sorry I messed up this is a, a spatial derivative so okay it was okay fine yeah, um, and uh, uh, regarding the, your comments about uh, um, having something with, with a moving frame, we found it very difficult to set up a minimizing movement scheme where the function space is dependent on time. And uh, so this is why we went through this process of keeping it fixed for the moment, do the minimizing movement scheme in a, in a fixed function space, and then recover that that actually happens. Because if you, if you change time, if you make a change of variables, of course, you can, you can recover that as a full derivative of the composition with, the, um, with this transformation. Uh, but then the, 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 the functional setting was not very certain. So we would, that needed to be with, with a variation in time, and, and it was preferable for us to do it like this. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ah, thank you.